to the She Leads podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Garland, CEO and founder of She Leads Media, a global media company dedicated to the advancement of women leaders and entrepreneurs worldwide. I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU and Rice University, where I teach on the topic of entrepreneurship. I'm a mom to two wonderful young men and married to my best friend from college. Join me each week as I dive into raw conversations with remarkable, uncompromising, and inspirational women entrepreneurs and leaders. My hope is that these conversations and their advice will encourage you to put yourself out there and gain the visibility that you and all women deserve. We're all about stripping away the sugar-coated conversations and moving boldly in the direction of our magnificent dreams. For far too long, women have been conditioned to soften their words, modify their actions, and show up in the world to conform to outdated at best and harmful at worst cultural norms and ideals. Why? To keep those who are outside of the power structures from gaining power, prestige, wealth, and influence. This has prevented women from being recognized and respected as the powerful leaders that we truly are. The She Leads podcast is here to shine the light on all the incredible women, to encourage us to show up, speak up, and showcase the amazing work we do, speak with confidence about the innovative and transformational thoughts that we have, and celebrate the positive impact that we are making in this world, both personally and professionally. So let's do this. Let's lead. Hello, and welcome back to the She Leads Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network. It's the podcast network for women by women. Now, my next guest is very special. I'd like you to all meet Dr. Nathalie Caldera, licensed psychologist in New York State. Dr. Caldera is a brilliant, compassionate expert in the field of mental health, and she's a marvelous entrepreneur as well. She's the founder and CEO of a highly successful New York City therapy practice called Let's Talk Psychological Wellness. Dr. Caldera is also a very dear friend to me. We met at the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program in New York City, Tory Birch Cohort 5, shout out, woo woo. <laughs> um, and Dr. Kildara mm-hmm. earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Adelphi University right here in Long Island and completed her doctoral internship at Columbia University Medical Center. Welcome to the She Leads podcast, Dr. Kildara. Oh, thank you so much, Adrian. I am so honored to be here. I know, I know. I, uh, yes, I feel very special that we, you know, <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. So I look forward to this conversation. Me too, me too. And this is a, a long time coming. I've invited you on the show for a while. Um, but this is such a good time, right? Like timing is is divine. It's perfect. Uh, we're going to talk about so many things today that are super interesting in the field of mental health, in the field of entrepreneurship, and then also uh, just your own personal background and story, which I know that so many people are going to be interested in. So actually, let's let's actually start there. Let's start with your your background um, because it is very interesting and and how your background kind of led you down the path of becoming a therapist. Yes. Yeah, so right. I mean, I think the the one thing I always say like that's missing from my bio there is very important. I was born and raised in Guyana, South America. And my family and I immigrated to New York when I was 19 years old. So I, you know, finished high school in Guyana. And really, it was the sacrifice of my grandmother who, you know, left Guyana many years before we did and left her family, uh, everything she knew and came here on her own and built a life and then got us here because mainly so that her grandchildren could have opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have had. Wow. So definitely very grateful to her and also, you know, grateful to my parents who also had to make that sacrifice. And yeah, that that's a big part of, of my background. Well, that sounds like an amazing grandma. What what was your what was your grandmother's name? Millicent. 
Millicent. Well, thank you, Millicent, for bringing Nathalie and her whole family here. I, oh, I appreciate you. Nice. <laughs> you. Yeah, <laughs> aw, she's so sweet. Yeah. yeah, all my grandmothers were very, very um, special people in my life. I lived with my maternal grandmother when I first started high school um, because my parents are both teachers and they lived in a very different part of the country from where my high school was going to be. So I spent a whole year with my maternal grandmother, Alice. And so, they, you know, both grandmothers have been very influential in the person I am today. I love that. So so here you are, you come to the United States, you're 19 years old, uh, and you go to college, I, I assume. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about, you know, what made you choose to go into the field of mental health? Ah, so great question. I actually started out as a business management finance major. Oh, wow. And I would say like in the, my second year of college, uh, maybe it was my third year, I took a class called Psychology of Women with a wonderful professor named Dr. Nancy Romer. And one of her, you know, like hallmarks of the way she taught was really that you must have community experience like outside of the classroom so like whatever she was teaching in the class you should have the you know attending experience in the community and so one of the things that she herself had worked at this wonderful camp when she was a teenager and it was something that she offered after the class um, during the summer and I went with that program. It was up in beautiful Rhinebeck, New York, a camp called Camp Ramapo that still exists. And wow. the focus there was working with children who had had very uh, traumatic lives and helping them manage their emotions, teaching them skills, classroom skills, as well as emotional regulation skills. But these are children who had had like very serious traumatic events in their lives, whether it was physical, sexual abuse. And I really enjoyed that experience so much. One of the reasons I enjoyed it was also because the greenness of upstate New York that reminded me of oh, Guyana. Guyana. And I came back and I changed my major to psychology and that was the beginning of my my psychology journey. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I, I I've never heard that story. I love that so much. Uh, yeah, upstate New York yeah. is is quite beautiful. I grew up up not quite all the way up in Rhinebeck, but uh, I grew up upstate, so uh, I know exactly what that's like along the Hudson River there. So beautiful. Yeah. So that's amazing. So many people, when they, you know, go into therapy, they either, you know, join a hospital or they they start their own private practice and then they sort of stay in private practice on their own. Yes, they have a, a business. And I'd love for you to sort of tell the story, but I'm I'm sure that you had a, a practice of your own for, you know, several years. But then it's probably your business background that uh, made you think, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I can serve more people if I have a larger staff of people. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what prompted you to start your business that you have today? Right. So when I um, graduated, you know, when I finished internship, one of the challenges I was facing was a giant student loan bill. <laughs> oh, no, really? <laughs> Which is, you know, a reality for so many people who take that leap into graduate school. So I actually stayed working in research. And I did that for about 10 years because research is a field where there are opportunities to be able to repay your student loans a little bit faster. So there are mm. programs where if you are committed to the field of research, you are able to have some opportunities to have those student loans paid uh, repaid. So anybody out there who <laughs> is on that path, that's something good to know. After about a decade, while 
you know, working full time in research and part time private practice, I realized that I really liked research, but I loved the clinical work even more. And so I decided to transition to full time private practice. So I left research and I started full time private practice. And that uh, offered me an opportunity to really focus on the clinical work. I work primarily with adults, like, and my focus is really on helping people with a history of trauma manage those reactions as well as specializing in helping people with anxiety and anxiety-related disorders. What I found was that I was pretty overwhelmed pretty quickly with the number of people who were seeking help. Mm. And I was very lucky in those early years, which was about 12 years ago now, that I was able to find other colleagues who were offering a way to teach you how to be an entrepreneur, right? So Mm -hmm. now we're very lucky, particularly in our field, where there are a lot of opportunities to learn how to start your own private practice or even how to have your own group practice. But 12 years ago, that was not something that was, you know, very available. But I Mm. did have the opportunity to find two colleagues who were having a webinar on how to start your own group practice. As I said, I was pretty overwhelmed with how many people were seeking services that I had this like very long wait list. And that was the opportunity that they were talking about, that if you find that you have a a long wait list, you should be thinking about how you can help more people by hiring other therapists who are not yet ready to start their own private practice, but are on the path to starting their own practice. And so I took that webinar and it was so helpful. But to be honest, Mm -hmm. it actually, because I had no experience in running a business outside of a solo practice, it took me about a year sitting on the information before I actually took the leap to hire the first person. Mm. Yeah, that that's sort of how it started. <laughs> yeah, that can be very scary and not just for therapy practice, but for any solo entrepreneur that, you know, they're sort of overwhelmed with work, overwhelmed with clients. And then, you know, if you haven't sort of set yourself up for hiring somebody, bringing that first person on can be a very scary prospect because you not only have to think about yourself and paying yourself, you now have to think about someone else and making sure that that wait list continues to to grow and to be there because now you're responsible for someone else. So that is something that I find in entrepreneurship. If we don't sort of go into it, knowing that, you know, first things first, we need to build a team. We, we start pricing our services just to accommodate ourselves. And we don't think about the bigger picture of it. And it's, it's so... It, it's great that you were able to, especially in your niche, you were able to find a resource that could help you. So after you hired that first person, and I, I think this is so important for everybody that's listening in, after you hired that first person, what what experience did you sort of have? And not not so much about the person, but actually managing someone now right? So you had to manage you, you had to manage your schedule, and now you had to manage someone else and someone else's schedule. Right. So that's actually where I encountered the biggest challenge because, you know, I had no experience managing another person. Like I'd managed people in very structured environments, like on a research project, let's say, but not where, you know, those the responsibility for their well-being, the the well-being of the clients that they were taking care of, as well as their schedule, how they're paid, when they're paid, all of these things. I 
the six week seminar did not necessarily <laughs> give me all those <laughs> tools. So I basically had to learn as I was doing it. Um, I did one of the w- one of the, th- the ways that I managed it was that I tried to hire one person at a time, and mm. I found that 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 was very helpful in managing this new task or new challenge of really learning to manage people. Yeah, you know, manage their needs as well as the needs of the practice as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we met, your business was growing, scaling, and I believe you were at, you know, eight, 10 people at that point. So you came into the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program, just like I did, in order to figure out, you know, where the opportunities were in order to grow and scale your business. Because As entrepreneurs, that's kind of the message that we're fed, right? Like, if you have a business, you need to keep growing and you need to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And I know it's so funny. We'll talk about this, but so many of the people that are, that were in our cohort, I think, have sort of, you know, we, we all, agreed that we wanted to grow our business and make it more healthy and and all of that. And I think that the prospect of scaling, it was sort of overwhelming for a lot of us. And so some have gone on to very great success. We have some people in our, that were in our cohort that are like superstars. Um, And then others have shut their business down. Others have, you know, pulled back different things like that. So can you talk a little bit about your experience? Because I know things also shifted during COVID. So here you were, Goldman Sachs, trying to grow your business. So can you just kind of take us through that whole entire process? Yeah, so definitely when we, when I um, started a program at Goldman Sachs, the that was the idea, right? For the that, like the standard way that you, operate as a business owner is to have the ambition to grow as yes. big as you can. And I, I definitely, um, that's all I knew at the time. And I am very grateful for that program in that, you know, I met you and other wonderful people, but I also got the foundations of actually how to run a business, you know, like, yeah and how to operate as an entrepreneur. I mean, all of the nuts and bolts, I feel that that program was really very good at, like every aspect of what the foundation of a business should look like. I do think that there was one, you know, area I know we've talked about at length about that may have set up us for, I don't know, maybe a more even success rate if we had been paired up or mentored by people who were even further along in the, their business or entrepreneurial journey after yeah. the program. But all that said, um, I think overall, I found it ex- exceedingly helpful, you know, gave me a lot more confidence in what I was doing in terms of running the group and, you know, helping, like keeping focused on what the actual mission was while focusing on making sure things were effective in terms of like people had the benefits they needed, the tools they needed, et cetera. And then, yeah, like, um, so that was around 2017, 2018, going along with that idea of like, growing 2019 we had our own space and then yes i mean 2020 hit and it hit everyone in you know different ways and it definitely affected us as well in a significant way that as we know it was a collective traumatic experience for the country and for the world and People were really seeking a lot more help than before, so much so that we ended up doubling, you know, our Mm. staff. And I think that it hasn't really, it didn't really strike me until like, as we're really recovering 
from COVID, like years later, that taking a step back and thinking about what does success in business actually mean and that it could mean different things for different people. And it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to mean that you are growing to the biggest or as big as you can. Because what I realized for myself personally is that I actually liked the pre-COVID practice a lot <laughs> more than I that I liked the post-COVID practice, which was double in size, many more people to be responsible for, and many, many more tasks and things to manage, people to manage, myself to manage differently because I have to, you know, pivot to doing things a lot differently. I have to delegate more, think more about how I'm leading, just a lot more responsibilities that I really don't think that, you know, for me personally, like it's something that may sit well with other people, but it really has been uh, very stressful (laughs) to manage. And it was really, you know, we grew at that rate it was more in reaction to enormously traumatic event rather than yeah. it was something that I thought about and decided that this is something that I want. Mm. So right now I am in the process of taking a step back and really we we haven't hired anyone new in the past 18 months or so and just focusing on where I'd like to see the practice going. And I think it's more something at this point that I prefer the small, like I think of success as something that's smaller, more focused on, you know, the impact we're having for the therapists who are working in the group, helping them to learn how to be entrepreneurs themselves Mm -hmm. in a smaller community rather than, you know, a big, large practice. I love this conversation so much because there is a a message, you know, out in the media and in society, I, I think as well, that you must keep growing, you must keep getting bigger, you must take over the world, you know, and and earn as much profit as as possible. And I think we talked a little bit about this before we we started recording, but in my NYU class that I teach, I often give an assignment called your vivid vision, and it's actually it's actually very similar to one of the exercises I think that Goldman Sachs did at the very, very beginning. I'm not sure if you remember or not, um, but we were asked, you know, what type of business do we want to have? And it was sort of like, do you want a business where you sit on the beach and drink Mai Tais, you know, all day? (laughs) Yes, please. But you know, if you want a business like that, you need to build a business that allows you to do that. Or do you want a business where you're going to be, you know, working 24 seven? Is that what you want from your life? And so Mm -hmm. this vivid vision assignment that I give to my NYU students is actually something that I feel like everyone really needs to do. And, and ask themselves, like, what do I want from my life. We, we have the privilege of being able to ask that question, first of all. Like, I, I think we need to acknowledge that. We have the, the privilege to say, what do we want, right? We're not in the place of like struggling for shelter and food and, and all of that. But yes. to be able to say, what do I want my life to be? What do I want my business to look like? And that is very personal, And I don't know that we give ourselves enough room to allow ourselves to define success in that way. And I think it's, I love that you are sort of taking a look at like, okay, where am I right now? And do I really want this? You know, and the answer is like, no, no, not, not now. 
and not right. really. It doesn't mean forever. Right. And that's the other thing. Right. It's a very empowering right. type of inquiry, self-inquiry. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, you know, it took me a lot of years to get to, get to that place and a lot of conversations with colleagues and and friends like yourself, as well as, you know, a coach to, to come to that place. So, you know, it's not something that I, I would say that I came to on my own. It was something that I spent a lot of time thinking, but also consulting with other business owners, as well as listening to podcasts and reading and you know, talking to my own coach who happened to be a a psychologist as well. So I definitely um, encourage people to to seek coaching when needed as well. I would say that, yeah, I do remember that exercise. So that's a great exercise that you give to your students. And that's so wonderful, by the way, that you're you're teaching now at at the university level, which is uh, something that, you know, to me, I, I, I'm not sure I have the patience for that. So I definitely admire <laughs> that you're doing that as part of the million things that you're doing. <laughs> um, but I do remember that exercise as well as another very important lesson that that program taught us, which was that you should have an exit plan when you are thinking about your business. And so the, your business is supposed to be something, and yes, money is important, but time is actually probably the most valuable asset. So thinking about how you spend your time as a business owner is very important. And I think that that lesson about yeah, what's your vision as well as what's your exit plan for mm. this particular endeavor? Like, you know, as a business person are very two very important lessons uh, to remember. And I think it's sometimes, I personally felt like it's something I f- would forget along the way because you get so busy running the business um, and all the different things that you need to take care of. For me, I also found it challenging to give up the clinical work. So while I've been running the business, I've been working as a clinician as well. And so that may have made it a lot more challenging (laughs) for me. I know (laughs) a lot of uh, therapists do the same thing. So it's something to think about how we how we operate as well, like how many things we choose to take on that then doesn't give us the time to reflect on these larger questions about, you know, how we're spending our time, how much money we want to make, et cetera. Yeah. And you reminded me even just now about this idea of having an exit plan, whatever that means, you know, whether it's selling it to someone else or shutting it down or moving on to your next thing. Uh, Again, and I I always say, I don't like to make sweeping statements and then I make sweeping statements. But I think (laughs) that (laughs) for women, we're not almost encouraged to think about exiting, right? Yeah. And it's in a lot of ways, Thinking about an exit plan is very freeing because it it sort of puts a, a a time frame around it, almost like it's a project, right? This is a project yeah. that I'm working on. It has an end date, and what yeah. is going to happen after that end date? It I think it allows your mind to be able to solve pro- that that to solve that problem in a in a larger sense, right? It allows your mind to solve the problem. What am I going to do? If we think that, well, God, this business is just going to like go on forever, it's almost exhausting. Yeah. And our mind is like, oh my God, forget about anything. I got to just like be able to keep my energy up to, to go through this. So that this is a really, really great reminder to everybody out there that that is listening that in your business and it 
the choice could be to have it go on forever, but maybe it's not you that's in that same position, right? Maybe maybe it goes on forever under the 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 guidance of someone else. And this is, I think this is such, mm-hmm. it's freeing. It feels free to me as like a, a woman to think that I can actually like give something up <laughs> instead of taking more right. and more and more on. Right. It's good. Right. Yeah. And definitely, I think that really spending the time to think about what is it that is most important to you, right? So what what is the most valuable thing and whether or not like you're in a different season of your life that you have needs that are different from when you started the business, let's say. And for me, yeah. you know, I do, I feel very rewarded by the fact that I've been as a group along with the therapists who have been working over the past 10 years We've impacted a lot of lives. And I like to say that when you work with one person, you're actually impacting so many other people because you're also impacting not just their life, but the all the people in their life. So all their workmates, mm-hmm. all their family mates, you know, all, all of their friends. And yeah. in general, the people, anybody that they're interacting with, you're also helping because now you have somebody who can, you know, stand in a healthier place, reacting differently, managing differently, Mm -hmm. that benefits the entire community. So I'm very Mm -hmm. grateful that I've had that opportunity to impact so many people and also impacting the therapists who've come through the practice. So a lot of the therapists we've helped either with getting to licensure, uh, that stage of their professional life where they are now independent practitioners, clinicians in the community, but also most importantly, teaching them the skills that they need as uh, business owners. So mm-hmm. that when they are ready to get into their own private practice or start your own private practice, they feel confident and ready. Uh, So I'm very grateful that we have been able to accomplish those things. But at the same time, you're right. It's like 10 years later, are my goals still the same as it was when I started the group? And it's not because I'm older. I ha- I'm now on the cusp of menopause. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's a great opportunity to sit back and kind of reflect on what what my needs are. And, yeah, my, my needs for myself, for my daughter, it's, it's very different than it was 10 years ago. Mm. So beautiful. And I just want to just acknowledge that, gosh, your business, it's it's so much, it's so much more than just a business. You know, I'm like listening to you saying, gosh, I I I sort of wish that all business owners could have the perspective of of not only the people that they're serving, but also the people that are working for them, that you're kind of wanting the best for them and helping them to get to where they want to be. It's such an altruistic type of approach to business. And it's really, really beautiful. And I, you know, it's funny, I, I know this about you, but just hearing you say it in this way, it it really moves me. And I think it's such a beautiful thing to be able to literally like teach people and empower them to go out and be sort of the the best selves that that they can be and also when you're helping all of your you know your your clients your customers um you're right. The the way that they react to the other people in their lives, it's going to be better. And so you truly are making the world a better place. And 
for that, I am so appreciative. We need we need more people to be self-aware and to go out in the world and, and just be less reactive and kinder and, and all of that. So you are truly doing such in, incredible work. And I know this, you know, I know this because I know you, but <laughs> well, I, just, I, I you know, hearing it is beautiful. That, yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So good. Such, such good stuff. I wanted to touch on two really quick things just because I I do believe that seeking therapy is something that is very, very important. People don't need to be in therapy forever or anything like that. But if people are sort of, you know, struggling through something, I know that there's also like a cultural aspect to not wanting to seek out therapy. And I kind of just want to put that message out there that therapy truly is for everyone and there's nothing to be ashamed of when you seek out help. Yes. So definitely one of the dreams I've had and I have been able to realize this dream because of the practice, I believe. I have been able to volunteer, return, uh, travel more often to Guyana. And I've definitely seen progress in terms of awareness of mental health, the need for seeking support if and when you need it, and that while there is still stigma and shame about it, that it is less than it was, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. The shortage of clinicians, mental health professionals across the country, across the world, certainly in Guyana, is a real issue um, for everyone. And it is true that in the U.S., it is still the case that only 15% of psychologists, so this may be different for licensed social workers and licensed mental health counselors, but for psychologists, only about 15 to 17 percent are clinician psychologists of color. So that means that there are systemic issues that need to be addressed as well for people, because oftentimes one of the most uh, frequent things we hear when someone makes it to that call that they the first call that they make you will hear that they've put it off months sometimes years before seeking help and the way people feel more comfortable is usually talking to someone that either has had similar experiences or that looks like them and so that is sometimes a barrier as well that Uh, people face. And it's something that I believe that, you know, the universities are beginning to address, but the process is really, really slow. But I I do think that since COVID, there has been a dramatic increase in awareness about mental health issues, the ways in which to seek support. Those things have improved. People have, a lot more clinicians have been able to start their private practices. People are generally a lot more aware, but there are some systemic issues that still exist that need to be worked on methodically. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. and, And consistently until things change. Yes. I want to thank you so much for all of the wisdom that you have relayed to our audience here today. And I also want to give you the opportunity to uh, just invite people to connect with you, reach out to your practice if they need help. So how can people get in touch with you? Yes, you can visit our website at talkingforwellness.com, talkingforwellness.com, or calling or texting us at 917-283-0738. And yes, speaking of my new, you know, thinking about what I am about to do next is thinking about how to help fellow entrepreneurs manage the stress 
that comes with entrepreneurship. So that's something that I'm working on. So stay tuned. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I really appreciate this conversation and opportunity to talk about what we what, what we do. Awesome. I will see you soon. This and all of our episodes are brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network, the podcast network for women by women. Thanks so much for listening to the She Leads Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support us, please share it with others, make a personalized post about what you took away on social media, and please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This helps our guests and our show to continue to gain visibility and traction. To learn more about how She Leads Media helps women to gain visibility, you can follow us on Instagram at She Leads Media, or you can head on over to SheLeadsMedia.com. If you'd like to network with me and other amazing women, don't forget to join us each year for the She Leads Live conference. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. the She Leads Podcast Network.